Hello, President and CEO of the Lutheran World Relief, Daniel Hello. Speckard. Nice, nice to have you here. Nice to see you, Phil. Um, Faith-based organizations, not that you're here to represent all of them, but insight into an image that we probably have that might be a little old-fashioned. Well, absolutely. Drag us into 2017. I would love to. And, and I know I can, can't speak for everybody, but for many of us, uh, it really is that the faith-based organizations of today aren't your grandmother's faith-based organizations. They're highly sophisticated development organizations doing very complex uh, projects around the world to promote food security and other uh, human securities. Uh, for us, for example, uh, in Niger, uh, we launched last year a $14 million project uh, that Lutherans were funding along with the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation at USAID uh, to bring food security to 100,000 people in Niger. Uh, but we weren't just doing it with those funding in ourselves. We were partnering with private organizations, including EcoBank, which was going to bring uh, agricultural finance to the project, Airtel, a telecommunications company, uh, which is going to bring mobile information platform that would do extension services, disseminate information, uh, and mobile banking. And we were working with Biajo, a, a, a French company, an onion processing company, and the the idea was to develop uh, high quality onions from our onion farmers there that would be used in uh, onion uh, cubes that are used all over West Africa for seasoning. So that's kind of an example of the kind of complex projects that we're doing now. What is the advantage of your organization, for instance, as a faith-based organization that other organizations might not have? Well, I don't know that others don't have it, but there are some uh, comparative advantages that I think we have. One is our deep uh, focus on relationship building, uh, which is that for most faith-based organizations, they've been working in these countries for decades. Uh, and as a result, have been working in very rural areas with communities that know and trust us. And that trust is an important piece. Uh, I, I worked in Iraq in the mid-2000s, and we tried to do reconstruction there, and we used lots of money in that American can-do spirit, and we mapped it all out in a project format, and we went to implement. The piece we forgot was how do you, you can't do that successfully until you've really built the local trust of the communities and built those relationships uh, that allow that to, uh, local ownership to happen and for that development to occur. So for us, I think that's been an important piece uh, that I've seen in the faith-based communities that they really understand the local cultures and have been working there for a long time. I just want to dig a little deeper into a Burkina Faso project so people can hear the kind of technological expertise that you have and yeah. programs that you have. Good. Well, we have one in Burkina Faso too, but yeah. I was talking about Niger. Yes. Is that the one you're I'm, talking about? I'm also bringing up Burkina Faso. Okay, Burkina we already Faso. talked about Niger. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about uh, Burkina, Burkina Faso. Faso. We're doing a $24 million sesame project to build right. a value chain for sesame. Mm -hmm. And the challenge there is how do you make sure that the sesame being produced by the sesame farmers uh, can come together and be of a quality that will allow you to meet export markets that will raise values. Uh, and so the idea for us and for many of the organizations working in West Africa now is how do you build that value chain to get as much value back to the farmers. And other examples of that that we're working on as well is this notion that we've been working for years to build the yields of the local farmers, to make sure that they come together in cooperatives, to have better access to product inputs at better prices and better marketing in their goods. But we're still finding that we can't get enough of that value back there for sustainability. And so we're in now social impact investing to invest in agribusiness like you've heard about today with others as well. And faith-based organizations are in that space. And I just wanted to emphasize that you know, this is not what you used to think about for faith-based organizations. What do people think about generally? What is the stereotype? Just so you can say it and then just say, <laughs> and that is not what is happening here. I think people are thinking that we're out there while we're giving uh, support and proselytizing. And okay. for most faith-based organizations, their faith drives them to serve their neighbor. And it's grounded in faith that they're doing this, but they believe their faith will shine through in what they're doing for the good of others. Uh, and so I think that's a little outdated. Another thing I did want to mention to you, Femi, is, or Femi, excuse me, is that uh, right now in Washington, everybody's talking about the budget cuts. Faith-based organizations, by and large, are funded from donations uh, from individuals across the country. Mm -hmm. And the Hudson Institute did a study that said for every U.S. dollar 
these faith-based organizations raise $5 from individuals across the country. That kind of leveraging, I think, is an important message right now in Washington to say, hey, this is not something that people don't care about. In fact, every dollar you put in, people are taking dollars, five of them, out of their own pocket because they care so much about this issue. So for me, that whole issue of constituencies is also central to faith-based organizations. We all in this room care so tremendously about food security and bringing it uh, to so many more people. Uh, but part of that solution, again, isn't just a project that we map out and do it in a very sophisticated way and from A to B in a perch chart. It's actually about building relationships and those relationships need to go across continents and oceans. And the people here care about the people there and we have stuff to learn from those people as well back here in the United States. So for me, I think that connectivity that faith-based organizations can bring to this issue of food security is actually central. Who's the most interesting person you've met here? Most interesting person I've met here? Mm -hmm. oh, wow, I think it's you. <laughs> and now we're done. Daniel Speckard, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.